Hey everybody, welcome back to the Brand Design Masters podcast. Today I am here with Michael Janda, who is a business coach for creatives and an award-winning creative director and agency veteran. In 2002, Michael founded the creative agency Riser and has worked with clients like Disney and Google, Warner Brothers, Fox, NBC, National Geographic. And then he sold his agency in 2015 and now he spends his time speaking, developing books and courses and social media content to help creatives level up. He's also the author of Burn Your Portfolio, The Stuff They Don't Teach You in Design School, But Should, and The Psychology of Graphic Design Pricing. He's won all sorts of awards and received amazing recognition from being on the Inc. 500 list of the fastest growing companies to Awe Awards, How Magazine, Print Magazine, AIGA 100, Addy Awards, the list goes on. So with that, I'd love to welcome Michael Janda. Hey, thank you. I'm excited to be on your show First time we've talked, and uh, I've known about you for a long time, so it's it's great to to finally connect. Yeah, the absolutely. old the old geezers of us have to <laughs> stick around together. We have to unite, and I think I got the heads up on the geezer for you. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> um, I, first of all, this is my first question out of the gate. If anyone knows anything about Michael Janda or has seen any of his content, there's this thing that he has with bobbleheads. I want to know hey, what the deal is with the bobbleheads. Thing. You know, it it became a thing. So I'm I'm a big fan, and and you talk a ton about branding, so you get it. I I'm a big fan of having s these little things that you can be known for, and um and and in branding on the base level, we we think about color or a, a font style or the Coca Cola little swoosh that you see on the side the corner of your eye and you see it on the truck and you know it's coca-cola because it's just that little wave and so for me when i started my agency i had like three little bobbleheads and one of them i inherited when my grandpa passed away it was a little chicago bears bobblehead and it's a total antique so i inherited that one and then i had bought a couple little superhero ones that i had on my desk and then when i got into my second office space i put my bobbleheads in the conference room and they looked just so sparse in there because there were only like three of them. And I thought, okay, I'm nerdy design guy and I love the superheroes, sci-fi action film kind of stuff. So I started buying a few bobbleheads and then I started looking around and thinking, man, this is like the most quirky branded thing that you can buy for 15 bucks that exists in all the world. So for $15, you get this cool little statue that has all this personality. And I just started filling them up in my conference room at my agency. Uh, and then we started doing the the fun thing of doing custom bobbleheads. Yeah, you did the all, custom of your yeah, team. Of our team. So after your 90-day review, when we knew that you were going to stick around and we wanted you to stick around, you'd get your own custom bobblehead. But the first time we did it was at our company Christmas party. And it was a big surprise to everybody. Nobody except for my office manager and my right hand person knew that it was coming. And so everybody opened up their custom bobbleheads and oh so, so fun. Oh man. So Just wait, all the so how did likenesses. you get how did you get the design of the and this is three D design of people's faces? Yeah. We how'd had you, headshots. And well, you we just sent it to the bobblehead company. Yeah. Yeah. So the bobblehead no. people, they just yeah, you they can did do it. it. You need you need your own bobblehead. You I were do. like made for a bubble. You got the, the goatee, the bald head. And you can do it like make a spit image. print on demand. You can just get one. So yeah, just one. They're about 120, 150 bucks oh, each. Oh, it's done. And, uh, totally done. Yeah, exactly. You need to have that happen. Yeah. <laughs> you you are a walking bobblehead, man. <laughs> Thank you, you, sir. You need to have. <laughs> and that's a compliment. From a guy like me, that's a compliment. Yes. We're very really distinctive heads. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about your journey. You you spent a little bit of time in agency corporate life, working for Fox yeah. and as a CD yeah. before you started yeah. your agency. So kind of walk us through that that early progression. Yeah. So the early progression, I started at the at the start of the dot com era. So I graduated university in 1996, and um, it was like internet all of a sudden is this thing. And I had one like half of a semester of some HTML stuff in my last class, my senior year. And it was just like introduction to HTML because nobody had anything more than introduction at that time. You, you were around back then. 
nobody knew anything. We were just like pioneering, how do you make websites and make this happen? And uh, it was enough to give me this foundation to be the website guy at every company I worked for, for the first three or four years of my, of my business, because anybody who didn't have schooling pre or, or finished schooling pre 1996 or so never learned anything web. And then the people after that had web in their design classes. It was some web related stuff. So I became the web guy at these first couple businesses and I bounced around some you know, low end junior designer type of positions like everybody does. And then I landed at a, a company in Phoenix that was um, wanted to do an innovative e-commerce environment. And I was just like always about one upping the expectations of my client. And in this case, my client was the CEO of the company who hired me to be the webmaster to build their company website. And it was a children's toy and book business that had some licenses for like these talking page books where you push the button and they had licenses with little golden books and some Disney licenses and stuff. So like the Hercules board book that you can push and hear sound effects and stuff. Anyway, so I start building out this custom flash style website because I had learned flash on my own and it was just so far exceeding his expectations. Whereas this this super interactive environment. And then he had me start hiring people and we started building out this world that was this kid's world called OKID. And it was OKID.com. And uh, we made cartoons and games and educational info materials and stuff all geared toward kids. And then he started raising all this VC money, got $10 million of seed money. And this is dot com era 101 1998 99 when people are just throwing stupid money at stuff not caring if it generated any profit if it was internet people were going to dump money into it and so he started raising money and and we started building out this thing i had a team of 20 something people and uh we built out this oh kid world and then to small long story short the CEO blew through the money, bought a Ferrari, <laughs> big addition Let's onto his house, out. all this kind of, yeah, all this kind of stuff. And, and then I, then the CFO came into my office one day and said, Hey, you have to lay off half your team. And I was like, okay. And so that was my first taste of that. And it was miserable and people crying and the whole deal. And, and then two weeks later, instead of paying my last paycheck, they gave me my computer. Now, Fortunately, and I had to sign a document that said I accept my computer and yes, my, payment. you know, my zip drive in lieu of my last paycheck. <laughs> so, anyway, so, uh, but fortunately, it was still the dot com boom, and I started applying around and ended up landing a creative director job at Fox over FoxKids.com and Fox Family website, the, their two brands, and I thought, oh, this is done. I'm, I'm here. I got a creative director job. I'm working in Hollywood. I'm right at <clears throat> Fox lot and have access to all this great stuff and working with super talented people at a multi-billion dollar company. This is, this is the end for me. I'm going to be here 20 years. Six months later, they sell the businesses to Disney and September 11th happens and they, and, and the dot com money blew up and we those older of us lived through that and tech industries in shambles and businesses are going out of business and and then all of a sudden this dream of 20 years became me thinking oh man i gotta find a new job because disney notoriously for dismantling businesses and downsizing and things um started downsizing all of the the team members Anyway, so I, I ran through that for a year and a half. And uh, during that time, I was looking for jobs and looking for jobs. And I had never been more qualified ever in my life than what I was. I had the resume, the work, I had everything. And I couldn't get a job mm. because people weren't hiring. Website people were getting laid off. They weren't getting hired. Nobody was building their website team in 2001. They were letting their website team go. And uh, I was so built into that because of my last two job experiences that that was what I was most uh, 
applicable to. Mm -hmm. And so that led to me starting my agency. So that was kind of my early, my early years. And I just fast forwarded to starting the agency thing there to give you a minute to, to chime in or ask. Yeah. So you were in LA, but you started yeah. your agency in Utah, right? So you got, I guess you went yeah, back so I, to Utah. Yeah. So I started my agency in LA. Um, oh, okay. I didn't start it. I didn't start it intentionally. It was out of necessity. I'm sitting there applying for jobs and what I got were freelance projects mm. because the marketing director from Fox kids who had become a great friend of mine gets a job at Sony and then she starts outsourcing stuff to me because she has no internal team because people didn't have internal teams. They were downsizing internal teams. So there became this big influx of outsourcing. And then her secondhand person landed a job at ABC family, which was the new brand for Fox family, which I used to be the design creative director over Fox family's digital stuff. And now he's the marketing guy for Fox family's digital or for ABC family's digital stuff. So he starts kicking everything over to me because I already had that relationship with him. Another friend landed at Warner Brothers. I started doing work at, for Warner Brothers. So it was a relationship game, which I harp on all the time for creatives. It is relationships that get you in the door of any client, but especially these big clients. You can't, and you work for Disney, you can't call Disney and say, hey, can I design some stuff for Let you? Let me send you my portfolio. <laughs> yeah, you're never going to get anything. You have to get some kind of a connection that gets you inside the door. And that's what happened to me. And I started freelancing for my friends and then realized, hey, I'm working 40 hours a week and I'm doing everything over the phone and email and instant messenger. And uh, thought, why am I living in L.A.? at LA cost of living at LA rush lifestyle. And we had little kids at the time. And then you're thinking LA school district and the whole nine yards. And it made sense to move to Salt Lake city where my wife has family uh, and her dad had just passed away. So her mom was a new widow up here. And so we moved and took the risk of moving away from those clients to where we are. This was 2002. But little did I know that 2002 was also the time when high-speed internet became commonplace in people's homes. Cell phones became commonplace in everybody's pocket. It all happened somewhere between 2000 and 2002. And then direct message style things, instant messenger and stuff became the way that people started doing business. And so it worked for me to be remote when if it would have happened five years earlier, the technology wasn't there mm -hmm. for me to be able to succeed as a remote based in Salt Lake with the majority of my clients in LA, it wouldn't have worked. And then you so could also were, be competitive cost-wise, right? Because your overhead was uh, not that was LA the big overhead. Benefit. Yeah, I played that <laughs> card for the whole run of my agency. It mm -hmm. was, hey, used to be a creative director at Fox. I know everything about the inside scoop on Hollywood marketing and what you guys are all dealing with. So outsource to us because now I have a cost of living or a cost to do business that's lower that can be to your advantage. I joked that my brand position, which I, it, it's half of a joke, but it's, it's really real. We were the number one third bid option for the entertainment industry. Out of all the third bids that they got for projects, they get three bids, we were the number one choice for the third bid agency. <laughs> the first bid was, you know, big spaceship out of New York and then huge out of New York. And then oh, let's get a bid from riser. And when they didn't have the budget to work with big spaceship, then riser got the work and big spaceship would have been 200 grand for something we did for 50 grand. And, uh, I built a great agency off of being the number one third bid option. Yeah, and you and you worked with yeah. some amazing clients: Google, yeah. Warner Brothers, Fox, everybody. Yeah, and so yeah. You, you ran that for about fifteen years before you decided to sell. Uh -huh. Thirteen years before yeah. I sold. And yeah. so, why did you? Why did you sell? Uh, anybody, and you've been doing this a long time. If you can survive more than like 13, 15 years running an agency. Uh, you're either emotionally done or uh, it, it ended for you during that 
run of time. And for me, it was kind of like this emotionally done phase. I had just come through a couple, a rough year where I had to fire my right hand person for some indiscretions that uh, were frustrating and some betrayal sentiment there. And then while I was on vacation, my left hand person resigned while I'm on vacation. This is somebody who has profit share and the whole deal. And then I came back from vacation to find a bunch of bad business deals that I had to dig my way out of cost me a ton of money. And I'm sitting there thinking, wait, I don't need this anymore. I don't need to churn this anymore. I had made a lot of money over my 13 year run. I didn't, I own my studio space. I didn't need the, the trauma of it. Now in the early days when I was young and hungry and poor, it was like, Oh, I'm going to grind this out. I'm going to make a name for myself. But when you're sitting there and you've checked enough boxes on the mountain, there's a certain time when you say, I don't really want to climb the mountain anymore. I don't want to get to the top of Everest. I'm happy getting to base camp one. Base camp one is awesome. I went to Tibet. I climbed to base camp one. I was there and I saw Everest and I took my pictures. Well, and also the air gets the really thin there and it, living yeah. in that thin air for a long time kind of takes the energy out of you. <laughs> and really then you're like, does. do I really, really want to go to the top? Yeah. 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 So that I, so I had some feelings like that and, uh, and it made a lot of sense. And I reached out to a friendly competitor agency because I'm a, I'm a big relationship person. So I had relationships with every agency owner in Salt Lake area. I knew all of them. I'd been to lunch with all of them. I had built these relationships over time. I had relationships with a lot of agency owners in LA, all the markets, man. I was like always just connections and connections, building relationships. That's how I built a lot of my client base. Anyway, so I reached out to an agency owner that was the one who I felt most um, connection with. And I said, Hey, I'm thinking about either selling my agency or retooling my agency. I'm not sure what I'm doing next. I'm just thinking through this and, and they were interested. They were on their biggest year ever. They said, Hey, well, we're, we're interested. They made an offer and it worked out and I stayed with them for two and a half years throughout the buyout phase and, and, uh, and started doing what I'm doing now. Cool. So let's talk a little bit. Well, I want to, let's jump to your books. So okay. you went off and doing your own thing, but you've written a couple of really cool books. One of which is burn your portfolio, which I love yeah. the studio, uh, the stuff they don't teach you in design school, but should. And yeah. so talk a little bit about that book and what that, you know, why you felt you needed to write that book. Yeah. So th that one, um, that came out of a lecture that I did. It was the first time I had been invited to speak at any kind of sizable conference. So it was 2007. I was about five years into my agency and I spoke at a conference. Um, you know, Seymour Quaff was one of the speakers and, um, um, Adam, I don't remember his last name is one of the house industries font guys. And mm. he spoke. And so they had some, some good design people there. And, and I was sitting there thinking, what makes my, what's making my agency successful? Cause we had doubled our billings a couple of years in a row and we had hit the seven figure mark at that time. And I was like, what is it that makes it successful? And I realized that it wasn't the design. It wasn't that I was the greatest designer in all the world. And that's why I'm getting all this demand. It was the, the intangible things. It was relationship skills. It was organization and project management and um, it was, it was defining and meeting or beating the expectations of the clients. It was all these kind of non design things that were the things that were really making my agency be successful. And, uh, so I gave this lecture on all that stuff. It was 24 at the time nuggets from the trenches. These were 24 things that I was, that I felt were making my business work as a, as a designer. And. I finished that lecture and then I sat down next to my buddy and he was like, Hey, can you send me that deck? I, <sighs> I, I want to make posters out of some of those to titles of those things for my office. And then I thought, what the heck? I don't want you making posters off of my, my deck. intellectual property. <laughs> so I was like, I don't have this published anywhere. So I thought, this is it. I'm going to write. I'm going to write all this stuff into a book. And so I started on the plane on the way home from Nashville, uh, started writing what became Burn Your Portfolio. And it was just, 
It was all the intangible stuff that they don't teach you in design school because design school, color theory, typography, composition, we're going to, you know, work on all that stuff. And you become so qualified from a design standpoint and production standpoint, but what is it? It's, it's the teamwork and client management skills and project management skills and these things that they don't hit on as much. Uh, businesses or schools are way better today than they were at the time. This is 15 years ago or so. Um, but I think a lot of schools are doing a lot better job of that now. A little than better job. Yeah, I, a little yeah. better job. They're yeah. doing a little better job. But I know that this is your platform too. I mean, yeah. this is the- It's my, you know, it's it's the drum I beat and the, 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 the mission I have as well is to prepare creatives for the real yeah. world. When I went to school, yeah. I went to school as a fine artist actually. And, you know, there was the, there was a wall around the school, a stone wall, and there was a sign for the school that faced out that said, you know, Tyler School of Art. And then on the mm. opposite side of the sign where that faced the school, someone had spray painted the real world. And that oh, really yeah. kind of, it really kind of did it for me because it was so true. It was like when you're in that microcosm of, of design school, it's a very purified kind of monastic yeah. kind of you yeah. know learning experience where you're like yeah. learning to be the Buddha, right? And then you get out to the outside world and suddenly it's like, oh, we got to develop a pitch deck and we have to like yeah. win the client. We got to take them out to dinner. Yeah. And then, you know, it's all about negotiating, you know, yeah. figuring out the phases of work and yeah. where, so there is, and I understand all of that stuff because I've been in that world, yeah. but a lot of people yeah. who are just getting out of school and don't, you've kind of laid a lot of that out in the book, but where yeah. do you feel that that designers should get that stuff? I mean, they get it from experience, from being in yeah. house or being in an agency, kind of in yeah. trying to soak it up, but is there a way that they can get it these days without that heavy lifting or that timeline? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, th there, the online education that is available to people makes me sad for myself when I was starting my agency because I had no resources. But now you got Philip and his whole YouTube channel. You got Mike Janda and his whole Instagram channel filled with one gajillion little nuggets that you can incorporate into your business. You got Chris Doe, who's a friend, both of ours. And yeah. Um, out there creating content that's going to benefit you. And, and I mean, so much of it is free. It's unbelievable. The amount of, of content you have available to help you level up in your business. You just got to become hungry to consume it. And, uh, you, you stand a much better chance than what people like you or I did when we had to start in the vacuum of figuring it out on our own. You don't have to figure it out on your own. So there's courses, there's content, free content all over the place. So find a couple people that you resonate with. There's two of them right embrace. here. Embrace. Yeah, back. there's two of them right <laughs> here. But embrace, embrace what they're teaching, implement it, and it's going to save you years of trial and error. That's absolutely true. I, and another thing you talk a lot about in the book is soft skills, the importance of yeah. soft skills and yeah. communication skills, which is kind of the flip side to the business skills. Talk a little bit about yeah. that and and how that is important to design or creative yeah. professionals. Well, you know, my friends who hired me who were working at Disney and working at Warner Brothers and Sony, my first three clients, they didn't, they didn't hire me because Mike Janda is the best designer in the whole world. They hired me because I trust Mike. I know that he's going to do work that's good enough and he's going to get it done on time. I trust that he's not going to gouge us on price. He'll work inside our budget. I trust that I'm going to enjoy the experience of working with him, the communication, the interaction. I, he can be a friend of mine. So I, I want to work with people I like. Um, and that's why they chose me. And I, I lost sight of this in the run of my agency when I thought, okay, I'm trying to replicate myself and hire people to do everything at my agency. And I hired people to run business development and stuff at one point, And it was to the detriment of the business. Mm. I started, I didn't bill as much 
when I was out of the sales cycle as I did when I was in the sales cycle. Um, because those soft skills are so critical. So it's interpersonal relationship skills, the ability to present and instruct effectively. You're sitting there with clients, you're selling them on using you. You're walking them through presentations and you're talking to them about um, the value you can create for them. And if, if you don't have presentation skills and you fumble through that presentation, then you're not going to succeed nearly as much as the people who do, even though some of those people are worse designers than you. You can be the best designer in all the world, but if you struggle with those soft skills, there will be people who out succeed you because they're good at it. Uh, Dale Carnegie, one of my favorite books, How to Win Friends and Influence People. In the introduction of that book, it says 85% of your success is due to your relation or your people skills, your ability to lead and inspire others, and 15% of your success is based on your technical skills. Now, take, uh, take the greatest CEOs of all time, S Steve Jobs. What did Steve Jobs do? Well, he didn't even program. If you watch the Ashton Kutcher movie, he didn't even program. He hired Waz to program his stuff, to finish his project at Atari. You know, he's hiring people to, to do the work. He wasn't the guy, he wasn't the best at that, but man, what was he good at? Inspiring. There, inspiring, presenting, um, ideation. Storytelling. You know, storytelling, yeah, all of it. And you look at the great CEOs uh, and they have that. Uh, Elon Musk is not in the factory hammering the, the nails into whatever thing they're building over there. He's out there in front of people doing the presentations, being the face of that brand, Jeff Bezos. Look at these great CEOs and so many of them show you that these soft skills are the key. It's not necessarily the technical skills. Yeah. Now what, you do have to have technical skills that are sufficient to do the job. Yes. You have to have proficiency. But, yeah. Yes. Yeah. One of the things that you mentioned a little earlier on in our conversation that I wanted to highlight for people, because I talk about it a lot too, which is that if there's one thing that I wish that I knew early in my career, my professional big agency, big corporate career was that all of the people that you know and get to know in the company that you're working for will eventually leave. And they eventually will yeah. work someplace else. And then yeah. suddenly you have a friend in another big company who's the so one who good. can get you in the door. Yeah. And so I, not knowing that was definitely to my detriment. But over time, you learn it. But yeah. that's why I encourage people to, you know, to uh, to meet with people outside of the design, you know, division, yeah. meet with financial people, strategy people, you know, account managers, get to know them, take them out to lunch. Because eventually yeah. they're going to leave the company and they're going to end up working at Disney. And then suddenly, you yeah. know, someone who works at Disney, you know, so true. And it's just like, I think that that's one of the most important things, um, to, to tell people who are in house, you know, and, yeah. and it's one of the best business development skills that there is, yeah. I think yeah. is making, well, making relationships where you actually are right now. Yeah, I, I look at it and say to myself, or I, and, I, and I tell this to other people too, but everybody you know is either a potential client for you or they know a potential client for you. Everybody. So you, once you start seeing the world through that lens, right. it, it changes behavior. Now, I think people see through that sometimes. If you're doing it with the objective of, okay, well, I'm going to be nice to this person because maybe they land somewhere and then maybe they become a client of mine at the next place. I, I love doing it, just being friendly and making friends with your coworkers and with your clients just for the sake of relationship building, because my life is richer with more people in it. And, you know, I, I get excited when I get on a new call with somebody like you who we have so much overlapping. And this is the start of a new friendship between the two of us that I know will go on for the next decade or 20 before you and I croak from old age. It's gonna exist for that time. And so I get excited about that, regardless of what monetary 
benefit comes out of this? Do people get more subscribers on your channel or my channel or they buy more courses or you they hire you for something because of this interview? Who knows? You don't do it because of that. You do it just because of that connection and my life is richer with more relationships in it. And then let those opportunities become the byproduct of that and they will. They yeah. will for sure. And that's the authenticity. Yeah. So let's yeah. let's pivot a little bit and talk about your now you sold your agency and you're pivoting to developing your own personal brand. So you're doing yeah. courses and you're big on Instagram and you're writing, you wrote two books, you're speaking. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about that transition. You were big mucky muck. You were the head mm -hmm. dude at this agency that was, you know, you did a big earn out mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. suddenly you walk out, you're in your home office alone. Yeah. What happens? Yeah. I, I spent six months sitting in my hot tub. I'm not kidding. It was like every day I'd sit in my hot tub for three hours and, and I was like trying to detox. Like, Damn, what just happened? <laughs> I had to detox. That's how it felt like. It was like a 15 year car accident that I was trying to recover from is what it, what it felt like. And uh, so I spent six months just not doing much. I was just like, get my feet back under me. I knew that what I wanted to do was what I had figured out what my passion was while I was running my agency. And of all the things that I love the most at my agency, it was the mentoring my employees. It was the over the shoulder designing with my designers. It was the, the um, team meetings. We did every payday a, a team meeting and I would prepare presentations and stuff. I had achieved enough that I was starting to speak at events and things. And I had my first book done and I knew that this was what I really wanted to do. I wanted to build an audience and genuinely help people with all the crap that nobody taught me when I started and I had to just figure it out. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to get a lot of passion out of this. So it became the thing, it became my hedgehog concept or my ikigai it became the thing that I knew I wanted to do next. Now, I spent that six months kind of gearing up for the confidence of it. I had, I had climbed a lot of mountains, but I had never built my own audience. And I was like, man, what if, what if I start making content and nobody likes it? What if I don't grow? And what if it, what if, and this is the imposter syndrome that anybody starting to make content starts to feel. And I felt it, <laughs> it took me a while to muster up the courage to, to actually start. And in fact, I didn't start until I, I, I had been to Russia a few times and I spoke at a conference in Moscow and the conference was a digital marketing conference. And it was all my, my lecture was how to manage or how to, how to maximize the micro moments that you get with people that three seconds, the 15 seconds, how do you create content as a brand? to maximize these little snippets of time that you get in front of people. And a lot of it revolved around social media because that's where we get the we, audience exposure. And I had like the massive imposter syndrome at the end because I give this lecture and I have this great experience and afterwards I'm signing books and people are taking pictures with me and stuff. And I'm sitting there thinking, I got like 700 followers on Instagram. That's my biggest channel. I have no YouTube stuff. I'm like the biggest imposter. I just give this lecture about how to, <laughs> how to build content and maximize exposure. And I have none. So I, I, that was the moment that I said, okay, I got to change that. And I got to so you do? put this so into you practice. Do? So I started, and if you scroll down <clears throat> on my Instagram, there's a post on 4-1-2019. So April 1st was the day that I said, okay, this is, I'm going to build, start building content. And I started creating educational content for creatives, business related educational content for creatives. A lot of the first pieces of it were from my pricing book, which had come out two months earlier. So I started creating micro content out of my book and uh, started growing my audience there. And then once it started to take off, I was growing 10,000 new followers every single month. And um, and then that was just motivation for me, man. Once yeah, I was how many like, you have okay, now? Like 125, 200,000, 154,000. Yeah, and, damn. Good job. Yeah. Brad. Yeah. It, it's good. And, um, it was, it's just, uh, once it was growing, it was just like, oh, I'm a content machine. I'm just going to crank validation. Yeah. yeah. 
yeah because like okay now i know it works i'm going all in that's so yeah. cool and to yeah. anyone listening i would say definitely go check out michael janda's instagram feed because it is like the poster child of great visual branding and consistency. Oh, thanks, it's like Thank you. killer font consistency, that yellow, yellow, black, white color palette. Yeah. I mean, it's like super strong. So, you know, he comes from the design world, but it's, um, it's definitely like an example of an Instagram feed. Well, well done. So congratulations on that. Thank you. And you it's are certainly fun. a and devotee of Helvetica. I can tell that. <laughs> oh man, they can't. It's like, I got like two font choices in my life. It's Helvetica or Gotham. And right. that's, that's and that, that, you know, pretty much not choosing anything yeah, else. Yeah, I think Chris Doe's got like seven. I think he's got like yeah. seven fonts that are worth using. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like yeah. after the older you it get, the, the less fonts you realize actually you need in life. Yeah. Um, Every once in a while you'll see me, I, I like, tire of my own brand and i design something that's a little bit red off. herring <laughs> yeah, yeah it is and uh, sometimes it's just to get my own creative my pent-up creativity out of me and so yeah. do you do it all so, do you do all your creative you yeah have a team. i do no you do, you do I, it all yourself yeah you know i did the team thing for a lot of years and the overhead thing and i i just um, yeah. And I don't trust people. This is my personal brand and mm. I don't now I don't trust people to create for my personal brand. Now, m two of my older sons both can edit video and they've edited video for me, uh, for my courses and some of my YouTube content and stuff. And I was going to ask um, you but, about that. I was going to ask you about who edited yeah. your video, your YouTube videos. Cause it's, yeah, but that's most of fun. them I edit. Yeah. Most of them I edit and, right. uh, yeah. I don't know. I, I, I don't take my own advice. I, I get on a lot of coach, coaching calls and I help people figure out how to hire and um, get the confidence to hire and stuff. But I'm so uh, in love with the flexibility of my life right now mm -hmm. that I can't bring myself to have responsibility over employees or even a schedule. I haven't started group coaching. Uh, which I should have done a long time ago, but I don't like the idea of every Wednesday from three to four, I have my group coaching call. I can't bring myself to, to do it. So I don't. So it's so talk a little I, bit about your individual yeah. coaching. So how did that come about? Um, you know, that was the, the easiest first way to monetize this growing audience that I had. Um, I actually started having requests for coaching before I even offered coaching. Um, people were like, Hey, I love your content. Take me under your wing and help, help me grow my business. And so I was like, okay, I'll throw up a little coaching page and see what happens. And, um, and, um, that's just grown. I mean, I, I'm booked out several weeks in advance and I limit my, my session availability because I don't want to do it as much as what I actually have demand to do there are a lot of creatives out there that struggle with the stuff that you and I talk about all the time and they don't know how to do it. And a lot of it is confidence too. Even if you give them the tools, like my freelance course gives everybody the tools to do it. But I just got off a call an hour ago with somebody who has my course. They have all the spreadsheets. They have all the insights, everything done. They have their sales decks and their proposal decks. They've done everything to the letter of my course, but they still do a monthly call with me just to check in and they show me all the docs and we talk about their pricing. We talk about the dynamics of their business. They just need that validation to have the confidence to make the decisions for what comes next. And, you know, you think about creatives and when I was in that situation, I didn't have anybody to call when, when I was doing that. Um, I saw on your coaching page, you had very similar phrasing to me. I like to try and keep it as accessible as I can. I don't want to lock people into big, long contracts and stuff. I just want to be the person that if you're like have a client that's threatening you to sue you for something and you're freaking out and you don't know what to do, you, you can call me. Let's set up a call and I'll help you know what reality is of your situation or you want to hire. You don't know how to hire. You can't get all the work done. What do you do? give me a call. Let's set up a zoom call and do a coaching session and I'll get you squared away because I was there. So that's kind of my perspective on coaching. It's all about 
you know, trying to help the Mike Janda of about 18 years ago to know to what he's really sitting on, the opportunity he's really sitting on and how to take advantage of that opportunity. So you, I do, uh, you know, a mastermind group, um, which is, you know, it's not really group coaching. It's really a classic mastermind, but it's like, yeah, it's, nice. it's a group experience where people are able to get that validation and, and get help from other creative pros. Yeah. And it's like an yeah. incubator sort of thing. And it's one, I just want to share about that, that, that the first two that I did, I did, you know, I, I, I did a follow up videos with everybody and just asked them, you know, what was the one thing that they got out of it that that's going to yeah. last longer than the mastermind experience. And yeah. in the first group, every single person said confidence and yeah. it, it kind of yeah. blew me away. Cause I wasn't actually expecting that answer. And so now when I sell the guild, I'm my group, I'm always like, yeah. Confidence, confidence, because that's what yeah. is delivered by it. It's actually pretty yeah. amazing. Yeah, I, 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 I have no doubt because I see that in my individual coaching, and I know that that was what I was lacking all the way back when I was starting it. I, yeah. I, I just felt so insecure. I didn't know how much money I needed to have. How much did I need to have to hire this person? When I started buying my studio spaces and stuff, I had never been through a commercial real estate transaction. I didn't have anybody help walk me through what that process is even like. It was just like all this stuff that benefits and, and things and payroll and how do you do profit sharing or dividends or bonuses for employees and stuff. I didn't know any of that stuff. And then managing the clients, man, sheesh, contracting effectively and then holding clients to the contract. Man, I was a disaster on that stuff when I was starting. And so many creatives are yeah, so it's absolutely. the confidence yeah the confidence i'm not surprised to hear that that people get that from your from your mastermind yeah or just exposure to yeah. each other having a meaningful yeah. network you know because so many yeah. creatives are isolated or you know either under their yeah. headphones or just not because they're not the best communicators they're not known to be the best communicators yeah but when yeah. you do get them together and you get them under one roof and yeah. make, get them to trust each other. The, yeah. what happens in there is, is just phenomenal. It's awesome. Okay. Let's pivot a little bit to like the okay. future. Um, okay. what kind of trends, I mean, now you're an individual, you're developing a personal brand, all sorts of content and you're educating other creative pros. What kind of things or ch trends or changes do you see in the, you know, the agency or the, the in-house corporate environment around strategy, branding, design? Are there any kind of trends or movements that you think that creative pros should be aware of? Um, you know what? I think I've, I've thought about this this past year and this push for the work from home life. And as a creative and as an agency owner and knowing the power of collaboration with your team members, with your, your coworkers, uh, I get a little nervous for the future of creativity in general because of this pandemic inflicted work from home mindset. And I saw the thing, it was Facebook, right? That the people said they quit because Facebook was saying that they had to come back to the office or whatever. And, hmm. or maybe it was Apple. Apple had a, a group of people sign a petition or something about being able to work from home because Apple was saying, okay, we're going to come back to the office. It was, you start seeing stuff like that, man, I get, I understand it from the individual standpoint, but I get nervous for the creativity of what comes out because I know that Mike Janda with four other designers is going to produce better work than Mike Janda by himself and getting that collaboration, that interaction with other designers, uh, the, the idea of that going away the way that it's been for the last 50 years in the work environment makes me a little nervous. So that trend, not, it's not a direct answer to a trend in branding or, or a brand strategy and things, but it's a, it's a trend in the work environment and the creative ideation style that I'm, I'm kind of nervous is going to be detrimental to creativity in general for for brands and businesses. 
So how do we replicate the in-office interaction, ongoing, you know, Sally slides her chair over to give Joe some feedback on what he's working on right then before Joe goes too far and does something dumb for three hours <laughs> without Sally giving him some, a new idea. Yeah. I'm nervous about that. Yeah. I don't blame you yeah. actually to tell you the truth. Where do you think create uh, like personal branding is going? Are you shifting what you're doing at all? Are you growing into an area that you haven't explored yet? Um, okay, so personal branding, yeah. I mean, for me, this is a new exploration. It's it, it's not so new now because it's two years. I'm two years into it on my um, personal brand push. Uh, the but personal branding is is so critical for everybody moving forward because the window shopping of now isn't your resume and the portfolio you, you drop off to the client. It's them poking around the internet and seeing your social media and seeing your work floating around different places and seeing this award that you won somewhere. It's just the window shopping happens through that poking around. And in the older days, pre this social media boom, uh, the older days, the window shopping happened because somebody came and intentionally tried to sell. You and I are getting our first few jobs. You're walking in with your black portfolio and you're getting your 15 minutes to try and position yourself into this business. And that, that era is gone. People are judging you whether you're there or not. And if you're not there, then they're judging you as not valid, not capable. And if you are there, it better be good and represent you because you're being judged on that too. So I, I can't emphasize enough building a personal brand as a designer. My recommendation is pick a channel and go all in. It can be Behance. If you love Behance, then do it on Behance. If you love Dribble, then do it on Dribble. If you love Instagram, then do it on Instagram. Even, even Twitter or Facebook or something, you could still do it. I don't recommend either of those two channels for somebody, who, a designer who's just trying to build a personal brand. It'd be one of the first three that I mentioned. Um, but man, go pick it and go all in. Create content and build it on at least one channel. That's what I did. I went all in on Instagram. And two years later, I was like, okay, Instagram content is not evergreen. It's not searchable. I have 600 pieces of content on here that nobody's ever going to find unless they scroll and stumble upon it. I better start creating content for a, a longer uh, living environment like YouTube, which is what I'm starting to do more YouTube content because people can find it. It can be beneficial to somebody three years from now instead of Instagram where my post is gone in a day. Uh, it's beneficial for the people who got on Instagram today and the ones who didn't may never ever see it. Yeah, hey, uh, that's what I tell people about YouTube. It's the second largest search engine next to Google. Yeah. And you yeah. know, when you search something that you get a couple results, but then there's always three videos from YouTube right underneath it, you know? Yeah. And um, so it, it really helps. I, and to tell you the truth, I didn't really know that about Instagram in terms of not searchable in the content, yeah. but it makes so, so much yeah. sense to me now. Now my question to you is, are you going to repurpose that content from Instagram into the YouTube format? Yeah, already doing it. All most right, of my content, <laughs> late, yeah, most of my content, recent content is the verbally delivered version of the Instagram post. Yeah. Um, because I've already done the, the thought pattern on how do I take this concept and whittle it down into something small and tangible that I can deliver to somebody. And Instagram has been great for me at that because I'm a long winded person. As you can see, if you ask me a question, I'll, I'll give you a 20 minute answer if that's, if I'm not careful. So, Instagram has been great because it forces me into eight slides. They give you 10. One's the title slide, one's the end slide. I got eight slides to educate somebody. And uh, it's forced me to become a better teacher hmm. because I have minimal amount of slides to work in. And that's beneficial to my YouTube content as well because I've already done the process of 
whittling this thing down to something more tangible for the audience. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's, uh, I think it's the, the constraints make you better so yeah, often. I totally yeah. agree. And I think also the, the, the whittling down or the distillation that you're talking about is so important too, because content, you know, everyone's in a hurry everyone's got an attention yeah. span of a gnat and it's like you have yeah. to make it yeah. digestible <laughs> or snackable you know because yeah. everyone yeah. snacks on content now no one reads yep. a 5,000 word you know blog post totally and yep. um so is so are you actually ex i i just keyed in on the long wind in this thing so are you <laughs> yeah. taking these eight slides and turning them into 28 minute videos or are they staying no. short or no, so the eight slides turns into a six to 12 minute video is, okay. is usually what some of those end up being. Um, some of them have been a little longer because when I get into YouTube and I'm not constrained to eight slides, a lot of times I'll add more than what I had in the original Instagram post. Um, most of them I'm changing so that it's not just like I'm walking somebody through the exact Instagram post. It's a redesigned version. And most of them are a little better. I've done since some of my older posts on Instagram, I've done 500 something coaching sessions with creatives. And so I have new insights that I didn't have then. I wrote it based on my one experience of my own personal life. But now I have the experiences of the dozens and dozens of other creatives that I've talked with. So I understand the, the problems that a lot of creatives are facing a little better than I did when I made some of that content originally. So it's, it's refreshed, re-edited, re redone. It's like the, uh, remade version of star Wars. It's like, it's good enough when it first came out, but yeah, this new version is a little better. <laughs> uh, they're well edited. I have to say that because I, I you. just watched a few of them. And if anyone <laughs> hasn't checked out Michael Janda's uh, YouTube channel, you definitely should because there is some Thank really, you. really high level content on there. And um, so, Michael, it's been great talking to you. I always ask my guests one question at the end, and it's a heavy question, and everyone knows I ask it, which is, do you yeah. have a personal manifesto or some sort of mantra that you try to live your life by? Yeah, for me, and I love this question, and I know what it is for me, and I think that it's why my audience grew the way that it did and why I have a, a loyal, engaged community for me, it is that I, I view my personal brand connection with people as a one person at a time interaction, one person at a, at a time sales opportunity. I never went and said, I want to have 100,000 followers on a social channel. I don't want to, I want to have 100,000 friends that I actually have built a relationship with and that I can fly to wherever in the world. And I've got people who want, want to go to lunch who already consider me a friend. That's what I want. And when I go about my business that way, it, the, the byproduct of that is success for me. People buy my course like crazy people comment on my posts and engage with me like crazy. I have a hundred DMS every day. I reply to every single one of them on Instagram. I'm, I'm just like one at a time. It's that one-to-one -one relationship. That's what I focus on. And so my mantra I think is just to add value to people's lives one person at a time. And if I die with a hundred thousand friends, then I'll, I'll feel like I had a, a life well lived. I think that is absolutely brilliant. And it's interesting that it completely aligns with what you're talking about building your agency and how you, it was all about relationships and it you was. built your personal yeah. brand the same way you built your agency through these yeah. deeper personal relationships, which yeah. I think is, is so critical and, um, yeah. and it's, and it's working for you. Yeah, it's working. It's good. And I'm happy. So it's That's, like wins all see, over the that place. That is a win. Yeah. And so yeah. where can, where can, you know, we mentioned Instagram, Michael Janda, where, yeah. where can people find you? What's the, yeah. what's the realm of your brand ecosystem? Um, so my how primary do, how do you channel, want, how do you want people to still, get in touch with you? My more Janda on Instagram is still my primary channel. I, 
I made a post a couple months ago that YouTube was going to be my primary content channel. And yes, I'm still putting tons of energy into YouTube. Um, but Instagram is still where my most engaged community is. And I don't go to bed without my DMs uh, pretty much at zero. So more Janda on Instagram, more Janda on YouTube. Uh, MichaelJanda.com is my website. And you'll see links to all of my stuff there, books and courses and my social channels and things. Well, cool. Well, Michael Janda, yeah. thank you so much for coming on to the Brand you. Design Masters podcast and talking to me. It's great to meet you. And I'm sure it is you the too. beginning of a long friendship. It is.